Okay. Uh, we will now start with our classifiers. And the first classifier that we are going to start with is known as the nearest neighbor classifier. Uh, this classifier is loved by lazy day data miner because this classifier really does not require much effort on your part to build the classification model. So that's why a lot of people who don't want to work hard, don't want to do anything, they like to use this classifier. This classifier is also known as memory-based reasoning method or MBR method. It is also known as instance-based classification. One important characteristic of this classifier is that it doesn't make any assumption about data distribution. It's not bothered whether data is Gaussian distribution or has any other kind of distribution. It just doesn't worry about that, all right? And of course, there are many variations of this method. In general, it is called KNN method, where K is one, in that case, it is called one NN or simply nearest neighbor classifier. Or if K is three, then it is called three NN method and so on. One can also have some variations and with those variations, it is known as weighted KNN method. It is also, uh, there is another variation which allows you to call it as an edited NN method. And also there is another variation which makes it locally adaptive NN method. So there are, so you can say there is a basic NN classifier and there are a number of variations on that classifier. So what is the basic approach of this classifier? The basic approach is pretty simple. It says store all your examples in a database. So, so you have, let's say thousand examples that are, that's your training set, you store them in your database. And along with each vector, you also store the label that is assigned to that particular vector. And then when you get a new example that needs to be classified, all you do is you go through some kind of calculation to find out which of the thousand examples is most similar to the given input example, which of the thousand examples is closest to the given input example. Or in some sense, you determine the nearest neighbor of the input example. And that nearest neighbor is determined over your training examples that you have stored in your database, all right? So essentially what you are doing is Given an example, you're trying to find its best match against what you have stored, all right? So the guiding principle of nearest neighbor classifier is very simple. It says, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, then it's possibly a duck, all right? So that's what this classifier is all about. So you can see here, the design process is really kind of non-existent. All you need to do is to save the examples, have a formula to calculate the distance or similarity, and then do the ranking or sorting to figure out which one is the most similar, and then read the class label of that most similar example, and basically you are done. So there's not much of effort involved. So that's why I said this is a kind of classifier that is preferred by lazy data miners. And I'm not saying that in a joking fashion because I have seen every year when I give the projects and people are supposed to choose different models, there are one or two people who always choose this model because they don't have to do anything. Okay. 
So here is an illustration through a pictorial example in two dimensions. So suppose we have training examples from two classes, class A and class B. And there is an example that we need to classify, which is uh, hidden under a question mark, all right? So if we are using nearest neighbor classifier and we are using a value of k equal to one, that is we are just looking at the closest neighbor, all right? Obviously in that case, this example will be classified as coming from class A because uh, class A example is closest to this, all right? Suppose we specify that K should be taken as three. We don't look at just the closest neighbor. We look at your neighbor on the left side. We look at your neighbor on the right hand side of your house. And then we look at your neighbor in front of your house. All right, so we're looking at three of your neighbors to figure out what kind of person you are or in what kind of house you are living in. All right, so same idea applies here. So you look at three neighbors. And in this case, if we look at three neighbors, the answer is different. Now, because two of the three neighbors are from class B, so we say, all right, this one is from class B. All right. Now you, you can see that I mentioned earlier weighted KNN, all right? So in this case, you can say that neighbors are voting for the class membership. So basically this unknown example gets two green votes and one red vote. And all the votes are being treated equal. On the other hand, if you said we will weigh these votes and the weights will be inversely, inversely proportional to the distance from the distance between the neighbor and the example that you're trying to classify. So if one example is very close to the input example, that example should get a much higher vote or much higher weight for its vote. While some other example, which is still, you know, part of uh, three neighbors, but it is far away, should have a, a smaller weight, all right? So that is basically what is weighted KNN, all right? So let's look at an illustration of KNN uh, in uh, using SKLearn library. So what we are going to do here is we are going to generate 100 examples. So if you look at X comma Y make blobs, number of samples is 100. So SKLearn has built-in capability to generate uh, blobs of data. So that is what we are using here. All right. And we are saying, all right, generate 100 examples. And we want data only coming from two classes. So that's why we are saying centers equal to two. Now this data, how compact or how spread out should this data be? We want whether it very compact or we want it to be spread out. So we can specify that by specifying what should be the cluster's standard deviation. That means uh, by giving a number here, we are saying whether we want these points to be well spread out or points to be close to each other. So if I decrease this number from four to let us say one or two, obviously the points will move much closer to each other, all right? Another thing in SKLearn library that you should always uh, keep track of and remember is what we call as the random state. See, many times what you want, you want your results to be reproducible. That is, you did an experiment, you got certain accuracy, and you want to now demonstrate that to your friends or to your colleagues or to your boss. You wanna make sure that you will end up with identical results when you are doing the demonstration. 
to do that, what you should do is you should always specify what is the random state that you want. So random state is basically because some of these data, this distribution of points is going to be generated through a random process. So every time that process is going to produce different results, unless you point, uh, unless you give a seed value to that random process. And if that seed value is same, every time you run it, you will get identical results because these random processes are not 100% random. They do depend on what are the seed values you are giving them, all right? So that's why it is important that you specify a random state in all your uh, Jupyter notebooks so that uh, you can actually set that up as a default so that every time you run it, you will get the same uh, distribution of points you'll get the same results, all right? So that is what we are specifying here. So basically what we are doing here is, we are generating 100 examples with two class labels, all right? So what we'll do next is we want to use a nearest neighbor classifier. So in SQLearn library, it is called K neighbor classifier. So we basically import it. And then what we want to do is we want to split our examples into training and test set. Remember I mentioned you need to do that. In this case, we don't need any validation because there are no parameters to be set. So that's why we are doing simple splitting between the training and the test set, all right? So what we are showing here is that the test set size should be 0 0.05. So we are specifying a percentage, how many percent of examples should be taken as the test examples and what percentage should be taken as the training example. So in this case, we are saying 0 0.05 for test. That means we want five examples to be used as the test examples and remaining 95 examples to be used as the training examples, all right? And again, we specify a random state for this because again, uh, SQLearn library does a random partition of your data into training and test set. So if you specify a random state, basically every time when it does it, it will do the same splitting, all right? So that's why we are doing that, all right? So we've done that. And before we see the results of our method, so what we will do is we will just plot all the points and show where they are, all right? So in this case, you can see that I'm showing you all these 100 points that have been plotted. Five points that are test examples are being shown in red as diamonds, big diamonds. The rest of the points are being shown in you know, yellow or the other color, representing the two classes, all right? So that is what we have. Now let's see, we use k equal to one, let us say, we specify k is equal to one. And with that, we basically try to do the classification, build the model, all right? So building the model is basically simply calling this method fit. So k and n equal to k neighbor, uh, k neighbor classifiers with k value, that is basically doing an we are creating an instance of KNN classifier, and we are calling that instance as KNN. And then we are calling KNN.fit. So there is a fit method associated with uh, that object. And that method basically then fits the training and test data. So that's the actual model building, you can say, is taking place in that, all right? And once you have done that, we can basically call for uh, uh, the result where we will do the prediction. So that is really what we are doing here, all right? So we predict the test set because once the model has been built, we can do the prediction. So the predict method basically is uh, the method to be used to do the prediction, all right? So KNN predict dot predict will do the prediction once the model has been built and that prediction is put in the form of a result, all right? 
So what we can do now is we can plot again to see what labels have been assigned to these five examples, all right? So based on the classification that is being done, you can see that those five red diamonds now are basically two yellow diamonds and three brown diamonds, all right? And since these were test examples and we know what label was created for them when we generated the data. So we can check for the accuracy. And in this case, the accuracy is 80%. All right, so out of five, four are correctly being classified, one is being misclassified, all right. This was with K equal to one. Let us change K and make it seven. So if we keep K equal to seven and rerun the uh, fitting and prediction and do the plotting, this is what we will get in this particular case. And in this case, if we were to measure the accuracy, we get 100% accuracy, all right, on the test data, all right? So we are saying, all right, in this case, we got 100% accurate results. Now let's look at what kind of decision boundary. That is, if we were able to plot, this we cannot do in high dimension, but in two dimensions, certainly we can do the plotting. So let us see if I was to generate for every possible point in this two dimensional space, a pair of values, and do the classification for that pair, then basically I'm classifying each and every point in this two dimensional space. And then I can kind of create a boundary or a picture as shown here, all right? So that is what we have done. So we have created a two dimensional space colored differently, which tells us that if a point lies in the pink area that is going to be classified as a point coming from uh, whatever label we have assigned to those uh, brown circles. And if a point lies in the blue area, it is going to be classified as a yellow, all right? And for K equal to seven, this is the boundary we get. Now, there are a few interesting things you need to note about this boundary. Number one, this is a highly nonlinear boundary. All right. Number two, there are areas in this two dimensional space which are small areas which are surrounded by another color. That means the blue boundary is not continuous, it's, it's kind of, there are two or three different or four components of this boundary at four different places, all right? So it's not that you are going to get a contiguous uh, boundary, you might get uh, different areas or different spaces of your high dimensional space belonging to different class labels, all right? But ultimately, the main thing is it's a highly nonlinear boundary. And this is for k equal to 7. All right. Now, in this case, if I change the value of k and use k equal to 1 and do the replotting of the boundary, this boundary comes out to be k equal to 1. All right. Now, One can do the similar plot for k equal to three, k equal to five, and so on and so forth. Again, the thing is that you get highly complex boundaries that come out of this model, all right? So that is what this KNN approach is. Number one, it doesn't require much of modeling effort. It does not make any assumption about the underlying uh, distribution of the data. The only choice that 
it required from you is to specify what value of A you should be using. For a two class problem, I suggest you use some odd value of K. K equal to one, three, five, seven, those are pretty reasonable values, all right? For multi-class problems, for example, if you have M classes, you should always use at least M plus one values. Okay, that's my suggestion, all right? Although you can use any value that you want, but that's how I feel you should be working, all right? So let's uh, see. Oh, okay, that, that is one or two more examples. Now let's look at KNN again through another example, which is using the wine data, which again, I have used it a couple of times to do the illustration. So wine data has three classes of wine. There are 13 features which basically rely on chemical composition or properties of different chemicals in, in the wine. And there are 178 examples. And in this case, the demo is using R. I had an old demo, so I thought, okay, I'll use that, all right? So we get that. We can do the scatter plots, which I have shown you earlier. So that basically are the scatter plots. Uh, let's see. We can look at the distribution of data in two-dimensional space. We can pick any arbitrary features. In this case, the features four and five have been picked, okay? So in this case, what we are going to do is, we are going to do the classification using normalization and without normalization, just to see what difference does the normalization make, all right? In the previous illustration, I did not use any normalization because all the values were in the similar range. There was no feature that was dominating. So there was really no need to do the normalization. But in general, when you have a feeling that there are one or two features that might dominate, so you should be doing the normalization, all right? So in R, to do the normalization, you need to calculate the means and the standard deviations. All right, so that is what is being done here. And then we can do the normalization using those means and the standard deviations. And then we can apply the KNN classifiers. And to do that, we can create again, separate training and test set. So that is what has been done. And in this case, we are getting results for K equal to three, five, K equal to one, et cetera, all right? And if we tabulate those results, basically this is the confusion matrix we will get, all right? So basically we are getting 51 of wine, one types correctly classified but we are making mistakes on eight of wine one samples, all right? Similarly, 50 of wine two types are correctly classified, but we make mistakes on 21 of those samples. And 29 of wine three are correctly classified and 19 of those are misclassified, all right? So, and again, another thing which, which has been done here is leave one out method of cross validation to rotate through all the examples and then basically take the average of all these calculations. And that is what I'm showing you in the confusion matrix. Now, we show the results with normalization. As I said, we have done the normalization. So we have two sets of results, one without and one with. So with normalization, now you look at the results. So there is no error now for wine one. All of them are correctly classified. Uh, the number of errors for wine two has drastically been reduced. It's only there are six errors. And wine three, which was uh, heavily misclassified earlier, now there is no misclassification. All 48 examples are correctly classified. So what this shows to you is that by doing normalization, we can suppress 
the effects of those features that have very high values relative to the remaining features. And because of those high values, they will dominate the calculations. So if we do not do the normalization, our results will not be that great. So normalization is a highly recommended step that must be done, all right? So with that, let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of uh, KNN. Number one, no training or model building effort is required. No assumptions about how the data is distributed. Choice of K determines the accuracy. For a small training set, K should be taken as one because you don't want to have too many neighbors for you know, 50 examples and you want to have seven neighbors, you're likely to get incorrect results. For large training set, K is generally taken as an odd value, which is seven, nine, or 11, et cetera. If you take larger K values, you will get a smoother decision boundaries. If you take a smaller K values, the boundary will be much more complex, com complex or much more nonlinear or much more rough, let's put it that way, all right? Now, this method has one drawback, and that is it can be computationally expensive with large number of attributes and rack. For example, if you're working on a classification problem where data is coming from 50 or 100 dimensions, then you are likely to end up with a lot of computation time and a lot of issues there. So if you want to read further about it, what are some of the techniques to speed up the nearest neighbor finding process? How many of you have heard of KD trees? Anybody has heard of K-dimensional trees? No. Okay, so that's one technique whereby you can actually speed up the process of finding nearest neighbors. And there are a couple of other techniques. So if you go to this link, uh, you will come across some of the other methods. And in sklearn, you can make use of those methods when you are working with a very large data set. All right, so we will stop here. And in the next class, we will take up the next model which is the Bayesian classification model. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.